Thank you, choir. And I want to thank Noreen for directing and those of you that stay for a fellowship meal, I don't know if you notice, each uh, Sabbath about one o'clock, the choir takes off to practice. So appreciate very much the work of the choir. Music has a way of speaking to the heart. As we turn on the news, we never know what we're going to see. The last couple days, once again, we saw some terrible events that happened in a country that's considered a very peaceful country, of course, New Zealand. Been there once, a very lovely country, wonderful folks. And the terrorist attack, we see those things happen in many places of the world today. Destructive storms, earthquakes, some say God has nothing to do with it. Others say God let it happen for a reason. One thing I've learned through the years as a pastor, when tragedy happens, whether it's a national one or whether it's a personal one, we don't have the answer at the time of why things happen. I remember a close friend who who I got a call one day and their baby had just died of SIDS. And uh, of course, they were broken up and went over and nothing you could say. You can't, you can't give answers for that. But yet as a Christian, the Bible tells us that God is sovereign God and he is in charge. Paul tells us in Romans 11:30. 33 he says oh the depths and the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out as we study God's word and I do find comfort in this personally as a Christian God has his hand in the affairs of all the nations he is still sovereign God. The scripture read this morning tells us that nations rise and nations fall. A righteous nation will stand. A wicked nation will ultimately fall. As we've studied in the prophecies, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, these different nations, they come and go. Sodom and Gomorrah, we read in the Bible, it of course fell and was destroyed. God sent a warning to Nineveh that they were going to be destroyed. And he sent Jonah there, though Jonah didn't really want to go there. God ultimately got him there. And Jonah gave the warning, and they responded. And they repented. And they were spared the judgments of God. Paul asks us to pray for our national leaders. And I tell you, if there's ever a time that the leaders of this nation, and I would say every nation needs our prayers, it is now. He tells us, I exhort, therefore, in 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. What's the connection between praying for leaders and living a peaceful peace of peaceable life peace results when leaders of nations follow the will of God and God deals with nations as we'll see today in the message according to the leaders of that nation we have the story in 2 Kings chapter 21 in the history of Israel David is the king and we read in the first part of verse 1, Then there was a famine in the days of David three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord. So first of all, we considered a, a, a famine. Now scientists would say, well, nature is causing that. 
The Christian's perspective from God's word is that God directs the elements of nature. We know from the story of Job, God didn't cause the destruction, but God gave Satan permission for the destruction. And when we see in the story of Job, he certainly was an innocent man, but yet God allowed these things to happen. And when, when we look at God's dealings in this world, his will is carried out in two ways. One, God holds back the evil. Or two, God lets the amount of evil go forth that in his divine wisdom he chooses to let go forth. Now there's an interesting scripture in Psalm 76 verse 10 that points it out. Fascinating verse. It's in the King James Version. It reads like this. Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. The remainder of wrath you shall restrain. So whatever wrath God allows to come forth from mankind, it will bring ultimately, though we may not see it at the time, praise to God. But if it weren't to do that, he holds it back. And I, I would say the very same thing could be said about Satan in this verse, because it's Satan, of course, that brings on the wrath of man. Surely the wrath of Satan shall praise you, and the remainder of wrath you shall restrain. We see that in the story of Joseph and his brothers. Joseph's brother's wrath was so intense, and they had such hatred, they wanted to kill Joseph. That was the wrath of man. But God held back, to a pretty great degree, the wrath of Joseph's brothers. He allowed a certain amount of wrath to go forward. And he let the amount of wrath go forward that led them to sell him as a slave to Egypt. And as a result of that, you know the story, Joseph ended up being exalted right next to Pharaoh, the second most powerful man in the world, and became a savior to his brethren when they came seeking food because of the famine. And you see that scripture very clear there. The wrath of man shall praise you. The wrath that God let come out through Joseph's brothers ended up bringing praise to God. But what he stopped, he restrained it because he didn't want it to go that far to kill him. We see that also in the story of Moses and Pharaoh. God sent Moses to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. God even told Moses, he says, Pharaoh's not going to let my people go, and I have a purpose in that. And so God allowed the wrath of Pharaoh to be poured out upon God's people. And as a result, God was able to reveal himself and his power as perhaps never before on behalf of his people. And as a result, the wrath of man ended up praising God. But God held back any amount that would not lead to that. That's how it is with God. Whether he's dealing with issues in the world or whether he's dealing with issues for his people, for you, and for me. That doesn't mean we do not run into problems because Joseph ran into problems. Moses ran into problems. But God worked through those to God's glory and their good. That's the difference for God's people. We read also in this Second Samuel chapter 21, it says, David inquired of the Lord. Now that was wise of him to do, but why did he wait three years? He should have inquired of the Lord before that, but he finally did inquire of the Lord. You know, this is a good lesson for us. In time of trouble and difficulty, remember for us as God's children, and I know it's hard to believe sometimes with what we go through, God is orchestrating whatever he's allowing to come into our life. We read in Psalm 66, verse 8 to 12, O oh, bless our God, you peoples, and make the voice of his praise to be heard. 
who keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our feet to be moved. For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through the fire and through water, but you brought us out to rich fulfillment. We will have challenges, as we all know, as Christians. Just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean the rest of life is a bed of roses. We will have our challenges, but God is with us and sees us through it, and God is allowing to come only what he knows will bring glory to him and bless us. And the sender of the trouble is the only one who can remove the trouble. If God chooses not to remove it, he will show us how to meet it and deal with it. One thing I've observed, you know, I've, I've given presentations in many parts of the world, and one of the sections is on emotional healing. And everywhere I go, God's people have been hurt. And there's been some terrible things to happen. But I have observed also, as God works in their lives to bring healing, emotional healing to the wounds that are there, many times those people become the most effective in ministering to others who are going through a similar situation. So God, again, has his purpose and letting us go through what we go through. Trouble does not come to the Christian haphazardly. Not at all. The world is say ill fortune, bad luck. The Christian says, my father orders all circumstances and regulates every detail of my life. It's important we remember that. When we wake up in the morning, <laughs> as we go through the day, when we go to bed at night. It is our Heavenly Father, and I talked about our Father last week, what a loving Father we have. It is our Father who orders all circumstances and regulates every detail of our life. How can we know that? Because of the promise, Romans eight twenty eight, And we know how much works for good. All things. And I tell you this, if it were not your Heavenly Father regulating and allowing these things to come, it would not work for your good. Satan would see to it. But God does not say, let Satan bring into our life something that will not work out for our good. And you don't want to believe that just because I say it. It's because God's Word says it. All things work together for good. For those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. We can trust that. So when famine comes in our life, it may be a spiritual famine, financial famine of some kind, health famine, uh, marital, children, whatever, it is our privilege and duty to do like David did, seek the Lord. We can ask as Job did, Job 10 too, I will say to God, show me why you contend with me. You ever felt that? God was kind of contending with you. Sometimes he does. Job, why, why are you contending with me? Well, it could be a couple reasons. First, there may be something in our life, we may not be aware of it, that's displeasing to God. Psalm 20, I'm, Proverbs 28, 13 and 14. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes, forsakes them shall have mercy. Happy is the man who is always reverent, relating to God in the right way. But he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. If we see the rod of the Lord on us, again, we have a loving Father. We need to seek God. And remember, God is our parent. He is our heavenly Father. And he will deal with us as those of us that have children dealt with our children. And there are times we disciplined our children, and maybe they didn't totally understand it, but we did it for their good. And Paul talks about that. Hebrews 12. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, 
nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. And as you and I seek the Lord in those situations, he will show us if there's something that needs to be changed, and by his grace do so. There may be that reason. Or there may be another reason. God may be allowing something to come into our life to try us, to test our faith, to give us opportunity to develop enduring faith, trusting faith in God no matter what happens to us. We, like Job, may suffer at times, whatever it might be. I'm sure every one of us in this sanctuary today are facing something. We may be facing challenges in life. Maybe it's somewhat similar to Job. Remember, Job was completely innocent. He was not suffering because of any sin in his life. It was not caused by sin. And God wants us to be able to declare, as Job did, and I marvel, though he slay me, I will trust him. That's where he wants us to go. And that's why God at times will allow problems to persist in our life, whatever it might be, whether it's financial, whether it's health issues. Now, I believe in my heart God wants us healthy. He's given us immune system, so forth. But sometimes things happen to us. And God wants us to learn patience and to trust him. We're told that in James. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Again, he's, he's wanting to develop this enduring faith. And there's things he may want to develop in us, other two, um, the older I've gotten the more I've realized that whenever uh, one spouse is facing a health issue it affects both of them and many times the healthier spouse they can face challenges too to be more patient to be more understanding to be more caring and tentative, more attentive. There's many lessons God has in mind when he allows certain things to happen in our life. And it all has to do in becoming more like Jesus. That's the goal of everything. As we continue here in 2 Samuel 21, the Lord answered David's inquiry. Uh, David, you know, asks, why the famine? Well, God answered him. I know the first time I read this story, I found it kind of interesting. It didn't quite fit in the way I think things should be. The last part of verse 1. And the Lord answered, it's because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. Saul. Saul is dead and gone. That happened years ago. David's king. It's because of Saul. It wasn't a recent problem that was causing the famine. No. You see, when Joshua came in, in coming into the promised land, in, in Joshua 9, you read that Joshua made a covenant with the Gibeonites and he said we will protect you we will not attack you we will not kill you you will be servants of ours that was a covenant God takes very seriously covenants that we make with him or with others well there was this covenant made well King Saul broke that and he attacked and killed Gibeonites It was an unjust situation, and God did not forget. God didn't just sweep it under the carpet. God still remembered it. 
And as I have thought of this story through the years, a principle has, has sort of dawned on me. Afflictions come by God on nations and individuals, one, of, one to bring remembrance sins of the past. There may be something that needs to be righted. And Israel was suffering for that, Saul's sin. And also, secondly, God deals with nations according to the conduct of their leaders. God deals with nations according to the conduct of their leaders. God will, in his time, reprove sin, whether it's a nation or whether it's an individual. Now, why, why did Saul do this thing? Notice verse 2. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. The children of Israel had sworn protection to them. But Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. Did you notice he did it for the zeal of Israel and Judah, not for the zeal of the Lord? He was doing it for himself. God commanded Saul to attack the Philistines and the Amalekites. They were powerful. Saul didn't attack them. Instead, he attacked the Gibeonites easy prey and killed them you know could be a little parallel here we've got to be careful we may choose an easy service for the Lord and neglect a more difficult one he's calling us to or we may seek to get victory over some easy sin in our life and neglect that real besetting sin that gives us a challenge that's kind of human nature we notice David's response here in verse 3. Therefore David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? That was the right action on David's part. Let the Gibeonites decide. The injustice has been done to them. They could decide. You know, the Gibeonites had held their peace for a long time. They didn't complain to David that a wrong had been done. They didn't disturb the kingdom of Israel by protests and demands. They waited on God. Good lesson for us. I guarantee you, you will be wronged and you will be mistreated in the world and in the church. It will happen, as you well know we too must learn to wait on the Lord. We see Christ's example on that, about not going on the attack. Human nature is to go on the attack, by the way, when we've been wronged. No. Notice Jesus here in Peter, he says, even here unto you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, who you should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile or bitterness found in his mouth who when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself for him that judges righteously. When we are misused, when we are abused, when we are spoken against, bite your tongue. Keep silent. Take it to the Lord. And I can guarantee you, God knows how to vindicate you. In his own way, in his own time. And if you start getting in there trying to vindicate yourself, you're just going to mess it up. Leave it with the Lord. And the reason this is important, because our human nature, we're sinful, we're prideful, <laughs> we get angry easy. That's what's going to happen if we don't trust and wait on the Lord. Because he says in Hebrews 12, follow peace with all men, even those that abuse you and mistreat you. Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man will see the Lord looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. 
By God's spirit, not one of us in this sanctuary today or anybody viewing this message today needs to have any ounce of bitterness in our heart. No bitterness. Now, we can't do it of our own, but if we ask God to fill us with the spirit, and if we turned our mind away from those things that are causing us to feel bitterness and say, Lord, give me your peace, give me your love, he'll do it. And take it to the Lord and leave it with him. He has a way of taking care of you and working things out for your good. Well, the Gibeonites answered, and they said to him in verse 4, We will have no silver or gold from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. So he said, Whatever you say, I'll do. David really wanted to make this right. Now, the Gibeonites had the right attitude. They, they weren't mercenary. They weren't trying to get rich off this thing. Um, they weren't spiteful. They didn't ask for their freedom because the covenant had been made. They were to be servants of Israel. Um, very unselfish response in that sense. Then they said further, verse 5 and 6. Then they answered the king, As for the man who consumed us and plotted against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel. Let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord chose. And the king said, I will give them. This is where, from our sense of justice, it may seem strange. But be careful you don't try to make God in your image. You see. Many of God's ways are past finding out. And also when you're reading the word, you also have some cultural issues taking place. So here's what happened. The focus was on Saul's household. They picked seven men. Seven is a, a number of completeness. And they were to be hung. In Deuteronomy, we're told anything that's hung is accursed of the Lord. And it says they were to be hung, hang them before the Lord. Satisfaction was to be made before God that God's wrath could be averted. This wrong could be righted. It had to be done. By the way, there's that principle today. Every wrong being done in this world today, and there's a lot of it, we either have to be made right or in due time God's wrath will be felt that's the principle and that's what we see here who of Saul's house was chosen you read in verse 8 two sons of Saul born through concubine five grandsons born through Saul's daughter who had originally been promised to David but instead Saul gave her to Adriel Saul sought to treat treacherously with David. He tried to provoke David. You know, it's a dangerous thing to seek to injure one of God's faithful children. There's an interesting verse in Zechariah 2, 8 and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them. We must be careful if we speak against God's anointed, against God's chosen, or act in a way, harmful way, toward God's faithful children. There's a lot of that going on in the world today. God doesn't forget. As we read this story, it, it may seem a bit unfair to us today. When you read the Bible, we tend to judge God from where we are in time and in our sense of justice and right and wrong. And of all times of our history, we certainly live in a politically correct time, which um, seems to want to force individuals to act in certain ways 
and we want to make God in our image. But remember the text also in Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord of hosts. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Things will happen to you that you will not understand. And your faith will be challenged to the core. And that is where what I call, we are called to exercise pure naked faith. Though he slay me, I will trust him. That's what we got to get, folks. Especially if we're living when Jesus comes. And many of us in this sanctuary today could very well be living when Jesus comes. All you got to do is look around in the world. And when you think of the nations, God is still ruling in the affairs of the nations. Daniel said, over here in Daniel, it says, The Most High rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whoever he will, sets up kings, takes them down. And God is still dealing with nations according to the conduct of their leaders. Who am I to make this next statement, but I'll make it. I do give a warning to the United States, our leaders, because as a nation, we are supporting killing hundreds of thousands of babies through abortion. Leaders have approved that. You know, we look in the Old Testament and we see, read about people um, sacrificing their children to their pagan gods. Not much different today. We will sacrifice these babies to the God of money because I don't think I can afford another baby. Or the God of convenience. Don't think it's a good time to have a baby. Or the God of ambition. Oh, I have career and so forth. These are as much as gods to us as pagan gods to them. Many a baby has been sacrificed on that. Our leaders have also approved and written into law what the Bible calls sexual sin. Some may say, oh, pastor, you're old-fashioned. Yeah, (laughs) I am because this book is old fashioned I don't think it's outdated and I don't think the counsels in this book don't apply anymore I believe they do apply and someday those that don't believe that are going to be shocked unbelievably no no I also warn our nation that God has been removed from our schools. I remember going to a public school in Michigan when I was in probably second grade, and we'd say a prayer before we ate our lunch. Nobody thought anything about that. Remove God from our schools, from our monuments, from our textbooks. Some years ago, even one political party removed God from their platform. But you know, God does not send punishment immediately, as we saw with Saul. God often delays his punishment. He is extremely patient. Why does he do that? Revelation 2.21, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. God gives times to repent, and you do hear voices in our nation calling for change he gives time to repent but what's sad is often repentance doesn't happen and instead Ecclesiastes happens Ecclesiastes 8 verse 11 because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil so instead of causing repentance the evil heart gets harder and harder and harder. And that's what we see happening in the world today. 
We see the Spirit of God being withdrawn from the world more and more. And that's why you hear of such atrocities in the world today. Now, it's not, Spirit's not being removed from God's people. <laughs> we need the Spirit more and more. And we need to grow in the Spirit. That's why I tell you, well, every day, ask God to fill you with His Spirit. And as you go throughout the day, ask God to fill you with His Spirit. But in the world, the things you hear, just like what happened in New Zealand, that's demonic. That's not human. That's demonic. When I look at the news and I see the Middle East and where there's been the conflicts with ISIS and so forth, and you see those cities, they were cities, a heap of rubble, unlivable. That's demonic. It's not of God. Satan is getting a stronger and stronger hold. Now we know Revelation 7 says the angels are holding back the wind so God's people are ready. But when you see these things happening and the spirit being withdrawn more and more, I tell you this, you best start getting ready and take that serious. Because there will come a time it's too late. But sooner or later, God will reprove sin. Like he says, Psalm 50 verse 20 thing, 21, these things you have done, I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. We know what prophecy says about our nation and the world. The day is coming when our nation and all nations shall reject the law of God and they will suffer God's wrath. I decided just to share one quote along that line. This is 7 Bible Commentary. 977. When our nation, in its legislative councils, shall enact laws to bind the conscience of men in regard to the religious privileges, enforcing Sunday observance, observance and bringing oppressive power to bear against those who keep the Seventh day Sabbath, the law of God will, to all intents and purposes, be made void in our land. And national apostasy will be followed by national ruin. You can see omens of that today as God's law, God's will, more and more being disregarded. That's coming. You know, I think I will read, I was, I'll take the time to do it. The song we sung, that last verse. To me, I, that's, that's once every man and nation. You, you sang it for opening him. <laughs> how, how apropos it is, seems to be for the day in which we live. Though the cause of evil prosper, yet this truth alone is strong. Though her, por her portion be the scaffold, and upon the throne be wrong, Yet that scaffold sways the future and behind the dim unknown stands God within the shadow keeping watch above his own. God is there. God is watching your life and protecting you. God is watching over his people everywhere in this world. And I would invite us all to take seriously the prayer that's in Psalm 139. And I know you do. You wouldn't be here today if this wasn't the desire of your heart. Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me and the way of everlasting. When you pray that prayer, you got to be ready for the answer. Because when you pray that prayer, God will do just that. He will search your heart and your thoughts. 
and see if there's any wicked way. And he will let things happen in your life to reveal some wickedness, some pride, some selfishness, some unforgiveness, whatever it is. He'll let something happen to reveal these blind spots because he loves you. And he wants you to get victory because he wants Jesus to be seen in you 100%. And you've heard me quote the text many times, 1 John 3, 2. He says, Now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he comes, we shall be like him. And why is that important? For we shall see him as he is. When Jesus comes back, we shall see him in all his glory and not be consumed. Because as his glory within meeting his glory coming and we'll just take one more step and go off to glory with him into God's kingdom while everyone else in the world is being destroyed by the brightness of his coming that's the day God is preparing us for and I pray that every one of us will allow him to make whatever changes necessary and that's why I've chosen for our closing hymn nothing between number 322 nothing between Nothing preventing the 
We thank you, Father, that you love us with an everlasting love. You love us so much that you were willing to empty heaven in the person of Jesus Christ, who was willing to come to this world darkened in sin, be misunderstood, abused, crucified for us, that we might be with you, Father, forever. We thank you, Father, for the assurance that as your children and you, our loving Father, whatever you allow to come into our life will be for our good. And Lord, when things come our way that we don't understand, by your Holy Spirit, give us the faith of Jesus to simply trust you. May we be able to come to the place like Job and say, though you slay me, Father, I will trust you. And Father, you know our hearts better than any of us know our own heart. And as we've sung the words of this song, Lord, we truly do not want anything between us and you. We wouldn't be here today if that weren't the case. So each one that wants to join me in saying, Lord, search me, see if there be anything in me that's between you and me, and remove it as my prayer. If that's your desire, just simply raise your hand to God. Father, you see our hands, you know the desire of our heart. We give you permission to continue to work in our life so that whatever it takes, that we can become truly just like Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.